Okay, welcome. With any luck, you are looking at our familiar introductory slide. This is Pub 101 with the Open Education Network. I'm your host, Karen, and I'm glad that you are back with us today. I'm going to spend uh, just a few introductory moments looking at where we've been and where we're going, and then we'll spend most of our time today with Amanda, who's going to get us started thinking about different publishing program models and types and ways that you can think about the support that you're offering. Oh, and there's my slide saying just that. I'm also going to spend a minute or two on accessibility and housekeeping follow-ups, talk about where we've been, where we're going, and then hand things over to Amanda. So accessibility follow-up. Last week, Jacqueline Frank joined us. Um, she gave a presentation about having an accessibility mindset, as well as giving us some concrete actions that we can take to make uh, documents and publications accessible. Amy asked a great question right off the bat that stumped us, and that was, what do you do uh, in terms of drafting alt text so as not to give away the answer? And um, Jackie followed up, and so if you want to read more about that, please refer to our class notes. The short answer is look for alternative ways possibly to quiz um, that knowledge. Uh, and the long answer is there is a guide for that. It's the NWEA image description guideline for assessments. And so if you're working on um, exams and such, that could, could be a resource for you. Also, thanks to those of you who gave it a go with our alt tag homework. Jackie took some time and provided some feedback. So uh, if you haven't already looked at her comments for your comments, please check it out. I also linked to our transcripts from our um, uh, orientation document. So if you want to review transcripts from our sessions together, they will be there. And oh, live transcripts should always be on. <laughs> and so if you don't see the live transcripts, let me know. Okay, where have we been together so far? We've had two meetings in Pub 101, this is our third. And really what we've spent our initial time doing is reflecting on publishing broadly so that we can focus our attention on key issues. If you will, the cup in which we will hold some of the more detailed information that we will start learning about in these next few sessions. So we've considered our role in publishing inclusive OER that contributes to a more equitable society and reflects diverse perspectives. And we've also explored accessibility as a mindset and practice. So again, it's, it's wonderful to prioritize these considerations right at the forefront rather than looking at a completed publication and think, oh wait, how can we kind of stick this in or, or make this accessible or, or do something in more of a remedial way. So keeping in mind that cup, where we're going, I think uh, will be fun and collaborative. We're moving towards the nitty gritty of program building blocks. So today we'll talk about publishing models. Coming up, we're gonna talk about call for proposals, what to put in there, how they can work as a communication vehicle for your capacity and what your program's about. Memorandum of understanding or MOUs, how you can clarify, again, at the beginning, with authors and anyone else you may be working with about what you're doing together and what your expectations are for one another. Style guides, how they can make things uh, better and also sort of more clear in the editing process. And then we'll wrap up uh, talking about publishing and printing and how to get the OER to students in ways that are useful and easy as possible for them. So that's where we're headed. Hey, Karen. Yes. Live transcripts are not on. Thank you for letting me know. Are live transcripts on now? No, I still don't see the option for captions. Let me stop sharing and see. Oh, I think I had to stop sharing and then I got an additional panel. There, I see it now. Yeah. Okay, 
I didn't have the power to do it. So <laughs> thanks for letting me know. Sorry about that. OK, back to it. Live with transcripts. So connecting where we've been with where we're going, I would like to invite you to continue to reflect and think out loud together in the chat or during our discussion after presentations about where we've been and where we're going, how we can uh, make publications accessible and inclusive, for example, as we're thinking about call for proposals. And Amanda will talk about that a little bit today when talking about designing publishing programs. And you know, think about what opportunities you see to support students through your role, perhaps, in publishing OER, if that's something you decide to do. OK, so that is my introductory welcome. We are now going to do a quick poll so that we can see where everybody's at as they think about publishing. And so I'm going to launch the poll. Can you see the poll? What about now? Poll? Marilyn is shaking her head yes. She's shaking her head yes, she can yes, see, it. Can see it. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, now in chat. Okay, thank you. I can't, I see that. I think I see the same thing you do. I see the result screen. So yes. I'm not much more. Yes, I just saw everything was still at zero. So I wasn't sure if any of you could see. So number one, how many people will be supporting OER publishing at your institution? Some of you have said we're not doing this, in which case you might say zero. Um, some of you might be acting solo, which is very common. The second question, if you are supporting OER publishing, is an official part of your job description? Yes, no, or hmm, good question, not sure. Number three, do you plan on teaching publishing technologies to faculty? Yes, no, I don't know. So for an example on number three, can you imagine holding a press books workshop, for example, or um, maybe supporting someone in law tech, or maybe you know HTML and um, you can help with that. And then number four, the final poll question, will you consider the OER you publish to be a reflection of your institution? And the options are for sure, we want others to know what we're producing and that we're supporting OER on our campus. For others, the answer might be not so much. We wanna be behind the scenes, pointing faculty to resources, but we don't wanna be seen as the publisher of these um, OER. And uh, the other answer is, I don't know. <laughs> what, what, is there a right answer here? So thanks for taking the time. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll so that you can see where you are collectively as a group. Hopefully you all have the ability to scroll so you can like look down the poll answers yourselves because I can't make the poll window bigger. Yes, nods, okay. So thank you for participating. This is good information as uh, we embark on uh, Amanda's talk. As always, there will be time for conversation and questions at the end, but feel free to chat in the chat as we go along. And with not, without further ado, I would like to introduce Amanda Larson. Amanda? That's me. That's you. OK. Let me close this poll thing. I'm going to share my screen. We get the awkward transfer moment now. <laughs> All right, let me make this big. Can you see that? Yes. All right. So today we're going to talk about individual and organizational capacity. Um, a little bit about me, um, I've had sort of like a long journey in publishing that started back in grad school. I was the editorial assistant at the Journal of Nar Narrative Theory, and that's out of Eastern Michigan University. Um, and I got interested in the open access questions that authors were starting to submit to me. And it was sort of my job to figure out like, do we have a policy? Answers, no, we didn't, but we did eventually make one. 
Um, and then I did library school at UW-Madison and um, had the opportunity to be the open educational resources teaching assistant there and got my feet wet in sort of the OER publishing landscape. We helped in sort of a grassroots way um, instructors make content in press books. And then I was the open education librarian at Penn State University, where I uh, co-led a grant initiative that helped folks make um, OER. And then I'm now at Ohio State and I am the affordable learning instructional consultant and 45% of my time is spent helping support the affordable learning um, exchange, which is the grant initiative at Ohio State. Um, so I've done a little bit of do it yourself. I've done a little bit of, oh, you have a whole bunch of people you have to work with. How does that work? And we're going to talk about sort of both models today. So here's my goals for the day today is we're going to look at goals overall for when you are thinking about setting up a publishing program. And then I sort of went down and made a list for each sort of version and we'll kind of flip and flop back to them because some of them are the same, some of them are a little different. Uh, but we're going to talk about goals, how you identify support at your institution, what expectations you should clarify, um, the importance of clearly communicating with all of your stakeholders, um, teaching the teacher. So if you're doing it by yourself, how can you get help to do that? What does that model look like? Um, building a community. And most importantly to me is how do you take care of yourself while you're doing this? Um, and we're going to start with goals. So I was thinking about when I looked at these slides again this year, getting ready for this talk, um, what were some of the things that were missing from the conversation? And I think that we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about what's the why for your program? What's the impetus for making this happen? So is there an underlying need on your campus that you are responding to? Do you have a mandate from your administration? So it's coming from the top down and you sort of have to figure out a program. Um, is it part of a larger initiative on campus? So is there an affordability initiative that's happening? This could come from, uh, again, from the top down. So it could come from like the mission statement and goals for the university. Maybe there's something about affordability. Um, it could come out of maybe your teaching and learning center. They wanna focus on equitable education. Um, is it, so, so is it part of a larger initiative? Um, does it support, support your goals for outreach? So maybe you're doing outreach around OER or open publishing and having some sort of program will help you reach people. Like there's a thing for them to participate in and learn about. Um, will it focus on multiple avenues of participation? So is it an adoption program? Is it an adaption program? Is it an offering uh, program? Probably if you're thinking of publishing, it's gonna be adapting or authoring, but there are ways where adoption could be Part of that to sort of like get people interested to start with. Um, and then is it part of a larger outreach strategy that you have um, for your community around open education and affordable education and equitable education? So keep those pinned into the back of your mind. So starting with sort of the do-it-yourself model, um, what services will you have the capacity to support? This is really important to think about if it's only you or a very small team, what, what are your actual limitations for what you can support? So will you be working with authors to create brand new textbooks? So starting from scratch, they're gonna build something brand new. Um, are you gonna work with authors to adapt and remix works, which is also quite a bit of work because there's a lot of things you have to think about when you're starting to think about how do you remix OER that is already existing. So uh, do all of the images have the right permissions? I can't tell you the times I've run across OER that have copyrighted images in them. Um, and you're like, oh, great, what do I do with that? Well, you have to source different images or get permission from the license holder. Um, but it is there is a lot of steps to that. Um, working with authors to make uh, materials culturally relevant or incorporate a racial justice curriculum. So something new that we did in response to all of the Black Matters, Black Lives Matter protests this summer at Ohio State is we thought about how could our grant program do something actionable about that. So we ran a pilot uh, group of folks who had already received grants in the past. So we knew that they were capable individuals who would complete the grant they were working on. But this time it was so that they could incorporate racial justice into their curriculum. I've also seen it um, termed as culturally relevant or um, equitable education. And this could look very 
it could look very different. They could just be um, decolonizing their syllabus. So looking for black authors to put into their syllabi to have their students read and to support it that way. It could be completely reconfiguring the OER that they have to be more representative of their students. So including more racially diverse images. Um, and it was really successful. And so now it is a part of our offering as an add-on. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is how some of these publishing programs around with OER might be coming from sort of that equity place. So that's something to think about, particularly now that we're in COVID and money is like dried up everywhere <laughs> quite reasonably, um, that there might be money for like making materials more equitable and that might be a place to do OER publishing. Um, so your thought about sort of like what services you can support, what tools do you have on hand to offer your faculty to create remix work? So maybe you don't have access to anything but the learning management system. So at my institution, that's Canvas, but it might be different at your institution. Maybe your institution has access to Pressbooks like through a consortium or through the OEN um, or have licensed it individually. Um, maybe you're interested in Manifold, which is also a really nice publishing platform. If you go through after Pub 101 and you go to the publishing cooperative, it could be Scribe. Um, and so thinking about what tools that you can offer to create in these materials, but also how will you support folks using those tools? So are you going to have a workshop that teaches folks how to use the tool? Um, and if so, how much of that do you have to figure out ahead of time? So thinking about the capacity that you have to do that. And then where are you going to host that content? So once you've made the OER, it has to live somewhere. Usually they're digital objects. So will it live in the institutional repository at your institution? Um, will it live uh, as a part of OER Commons where you could upload it? Um, could it be just on the web somewhere hosted? Will it be inside the LMS possibly? So taking a look at them a little bit side by side, um, we'll start with a do-it-yourself column. Um, are your publishing efforts supported through administration or is this a grassroots campaign? It could be either. When I was at UW-Madison, it was very grassroots. There was no money from administration. Uh, we had access to press books because we were part of a consortium that had access to it. Um, and the, the, so after you figure that out, are you just doing it yourself? Or is, it, or is it something that you're doing off the sort of the side of your desk? Like um, there's a lot of components to think about there. And then is there cash for OER? Especially with COVID, this question seems particularly relevant. I don't know about your institutions, but we have a huge budget freeze at Ohio State. Um, so if there isn't cash to offer people to do OER, what other things can you offer them? A lot of times faculty are interested in support to do that. Um, I've had a lot of people be like, oh, I don't really care about the money. I just need your help to do the thing. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, is it just going to be you by yourself supporting all of the publishing efforts um, at your institution? Or are there a few collaborators you can lean on? So maybe it's not just you, maybe it's a small team, maybe you have the option to get a student worker. Um, maybe there's an opportunity to secure a teaching assistantship for a graduate student. I mean, that's how I got into this gig. I was a teaching assistantship. I was looking for anything. And the OER one is what I found. And it matched up with my interests really well. And then I was like, oh, I could do this as a librarian. That's really cool. Um, if you're looking at a larger publishing program, so this is going to be probably you and I, a small to medium to large size team. Um, it's probably going to have administrative support. If so, which administrators are supporting it? And what are their goals for the program? What sort of things will they want you to report back up? That's something to think about. Um, institutional, does the support come from the top down? So is the, the president, provost, and then unit level? Or is this support coming from specific units? So maybe your biology department all wants to do what we are. And, um, they want you to work with their unit specifically to make that happen. Financial, where is the money coming from? Again, especially with COVID, let's think about where are the dollars coming from to do this work? And then who's on the team? So while you might have a large university-wide group who are thinking about this publishing program, who's doing that nitty-gritty day-to-day work? Um, 
are you doing all of the production stuff? Do you have production assistants? Do you have student workers? That kind of thing. You need to think about where the support model looks like and who's doing what in each step of that. So now instead of looking at just support, let's look at sort of like that institutional wide, much larger program. So who has a seat at the table to identify that? Um, so I would recommend that students be a part of your stakeholder group because they're the end user for the things that you want to make and getting them involved. A will get the attention of folks at the higher end because they listen to students. So your provost and president, um, they care about what students think. Um, they give students oftentimes platforms that we don't get access to to ask for things. Um, the libraries could be a good partner if you aren't already a librarian. Um, the Center for Teaching and Learning that could be named something different at your institution. Um, whatever, mine is the Drake Institute for Teaching and Learning. Um, so it could be called whatever, but they're focused on teaching excellence and helping instructors do the thing. So that's where your instructional designers are going to be. Um, faculty, um, the bookstore might be a good partner, depending on your relationship. That's something that might be helpful. You could use the press if your university has a press. Um, academic units, so it could be, like I said, an entire department or institutional specific units. So it could be if you had like another like teaching unit that was separate doing a thing, they might be interested in helping. Um, and while if you're doing this by yourself, it's good to think about your stakeholders in this way, but this is really a key for working at sort of that upper level. I'm running a huge program that's going to talk to all these stakeholders on the regular. So it's really important in both models to sort of define your expectations. So once you've identified what and how you can support a publishing effort, you can really start defining the expectations around your publishing program. What are your expectations for faculty authors? And you're going to talk, and probably think through this more when you get through the MOU portion of Pub 101. But it's a good thing to start thinking about, like, what do we expect from authors? And really, what can they expect from us as supporting them in this effort? So um, it's great to get this in writing before you launch. But absolutely, it can be iterate and grow, iterative and grow with your program. You can come back and edit it. Um, and you'll talk about this a lot more during the MOU discussion. So at the institutional level, it's really important to define the roles that each person is going to play. Where will it make sense for you to collaborate? So maybe you have instructional designers who can help faculty create learning objectives and goals for the materials um, or review the goals and learning objectives that they already have. Um, sometimes those can be set at the department level and they don't have much control over them. The instructors, sometimes it can be very one off. This instructor has these learning objectives with these goals for the materials. Um, maybe you want to partner with librarians. If, even if you are a librarian, you might want to partner with subject librarians who might have more subject knowledge of the area that you're trying to curate OER for. Um, maybe you have students who can help advocate with your administration for both administrative support, but also um, cash for your initiative. Um, maybe they do a student gift every year, and maybe you could get them to do one around affordable learning. So maybe oh, we would like to spend our student gift on making, um, helping folks make OER. And maybe the bookstore can help identify courses or provide print copies of OER at cost. Um, I have had both good luck with bookstores and bad luck with bookstores. So it just depends on your relationship with your bookstore and the needs of your institution. Clear communication. So I say this, this can't be stated enough. Um, it is really important to clearly communicate with your stakeholders. Um, if you're going to be working as the project manager and this means, in my opinion, that you should adopt an, an ethos of transparency. So there shouldn't be secrets unless they have to be. There have to be secrets because like you can't say that the provost gave you X, Y, Z or something. Um, but if you can be very transparent, particularly with your participants, um, it will go a long way. Keep them informed about what's happening. 
Um, create shared language early. This is really important if you're working across the institution. Um, and if you can do it before you get started with your program, that's great, but something you should be working on. Um, create a memorandum of understanding um, for authors that clearly details what they're agreeing to do and articulates what you will do to support them. Um, think of that as the contract between you and the author. They're going to provide X, Y, Z. So if they've committed to write six chapters, you want to get that in writing. And then if you are going to support them during that six, those six chapters by um, curating OER that they could remix into it, helping them find images, um, doing license checks for that material, make sure that that is articulated. And then regularly communicate with stakeholders. Even if you don't have a whole lot going on, I think it's a pretty good idea to check in with folks like once a month just to see how things are going. Um, and then think about what you need to communicate back up to the other stakeholders at your institution. So, so if the provost gave you money, they're going to want to know how that money is being used and what the return on investment is. So think about how you're going to track that information so that you can share that later. And very much communicate regularly with authors, establish that from the get go so that they know to expect your email and then it might eliminate some people hiding from you when they feel like they haven't done their share. Um, or wondering about what's going on. And if you establish sort of like a regular communication schedule, they're going to know when to expect an email from you and kind of what that's going to look like. So if you are working in sort of the do it yourself model, you cannot do everything all by yourself. Like you just don't aren't going to have the capacity to do that. You'll get burnt out really fast. And um, it's important to think about what you can support and then what you need to teach other folks to do for themselves. So in this model, I would suggest teaching your authors to be self-sufficient and self-starters. So you can provide training for how the, they will use the tool, but then give them access to the tool so that they can make the thing. Um, provide licensing training. So you could work with copyright services at your institution. And if you have that as an option to help provide training around licensing, it's really important they understand the Creative Commons licenses that they're choosing for their work. And then you can also think about train, providing training for open pedagogy. So they've created a thing. How do they use it now in a way that transforms their teaching? And then offer support for follow-up questions. Um, so if they had a great session on say press books and um, you do that one week, maybe have like an office hours the next week where people can just come and ask you questions after they've had time to delve into the material and played around. Maybe they'll have questions about how to do things because it's hard to take in all of that knowledge, especially now that we're all virtual 24 seven all the time. So also important for that do it yourself model and the um, larger thing is once you have some folks doing the work, start building a community around this. I recommend starting small. So if you are only supporting one project, start with that one project, meet with that team regularly. Um, and then as it grows, say now you're up to three teams and invite them to join that community. Um, and you can grow it as your capacity grows. So as you get more of these uh, books off and going, um, you'll fall into sort of a routine. And you'll be able to see spots where before it would have taken like forever to do a thing. Now it doesn't take so long. And so you have a little more capacity to do the next thing. Um, I highly recommend starting a community of practice once you have several instructors interested in doing this kind of work. Um, I recommend introducing your authors to each other, have them share their projects, invite them to discuss what's working with what they're doing and what they're struggling with. And this helps you find pain points that you can sort of help work out of there. You can support them through that. Um, and it enables them to not feel alone in creating the process, in this process of creating OER. As you can see, it is dangerous to go alone. You have to take a kitten friend with you. Um, and that's true of this too. I just had a discussion the other day around like, how do we support people through like working through open pedagogy and how many instructors are out there alone trying to do this work. And um, that is also mirrored in sort of the OER project because we're sending them off probably to write by themselves 
And um, it can get pretty lonely if they don't know that other people are doing it or running into the same problems that they're having. And the other thing I would recommend is once you've sort of started that community of practice, don't hesitate to ask them after you've got the ball rolling to maybe lead a session and talk about um, their specific project and how they're using it in their class because then they're sharing ideas and then other folks might wanna do the same thing that they're doing. And it's a really great sharing of ideas that can be really positive. So I'm gonna talk about self-care. Um, this is really important to me. It's important to me in all of librarianship. A lot of the work that we do is invisible labor. This is true of instructional designers. It's just true of folks who are administrating programs. Um, and in particular, you're working in publishing. A lot of the work you do is not gonna be seen by anybody. There's gonna be an end product at the end of the day, and it is gonna have that faculty's name on it. And so you might be doing all this work behind the scenes to get it there, but nobody is necessarily going to see you do that labor. So it's important to report accurately the work that you're doing but also to realize that you might feel isolated. Um, this work can be very, you can do a lot of emotional lifting with your authors. You might have to have really tough conversations with them. Um, I've had really tough conversations about why folks can't use a particular thing because the licenses don't match um, and or the image they picked is licensed the wrong way or is copyrighted and we can't get hold of it or even the thing that they are dreaming up is just not really possible within the structure of what we have. And those conversations can be really hard. You are also going to probably have tough conversations around why your work's important. Um, why is this important to the university to make OER? And new technology can be pretty scary. And it can be scary for the people that you're supporting, but it can also be kind of scary on our end to sort of dive in and have to be the expert on that. Um, and so there are a lot of ways here, and you'll see there's a nice tower picture on this slide where you'll feel really isolated. And um, it doesn't have to be that way though. Um, this work can be really hard. We're gonna shift over into a lighthouse now, a beacon of hope. And um, it doesn't have to be hopeless. Um, I recommend building a network, which is what you're doing right now. All these people in this room can be your network. Um, I will be your network. Feel free to reach out to me anytime with questions. I'm happy to help. I have a lot of experience and I'm happy to share that knowledge. Um, set boundaries for yourself. If you're only gonna work on five projects, when you get you know, seven that come in, really stick to your boundary of, I'm gonna work with five projects this time, but then go and recruit those people for the next offering. Um, Pre-plan your answers. So when you have those tough conversations around why your work matters, why is open education important? Um, how does OER transform teaching? You can really, you'll, you'll start to get them enough that if you want, you could sit down and pre-plan what your answers will be. Look at some research so that you have some statistics you can rattle off. Um, people like to hear statistics for some reason. And um, to say that a thing is great and is working, fantastic. Um, but you can, you can really pre-plan those to take some of the anxiety of answering those tough questions. There's always like one old curmudgeonly faculty member who wants to ask you about like the quality of OER or something. And if you just have answers ready and prepared for that, it makes answering those a lot easier and less scary. Also, you don't have to master everything. It's okay to still have questions. Um, and it's okay to continue iterating and the learning from small failures and not letting them block you and hold you down. Um, and you don't have to be the master of every tool. You just have to be able to get people the help they need. So some considerations. Um, are there differences between your capacity as one individual person and your organization's capacity? And this comes into play with both your workload and um, the expectations of your organization, but also thinking about who you can collaborate with, who you have access to, like that's gonna vary from institution to institution. So what, what, where does that lie? Like, what are you capable of? What is your institution capable of? And how do you set expectations that support both of those things? Um, does your capacity point at a particular publishing approach? So we've talked a little bit about like what it might look like at a big one, 
where you're going to have a bunch of different stakeholders who are going to have opinions about everything. And then also sort of the do it yourself model where it's maybe you and just a couple of people. Um, so if you're looking at your capacity through some self reflection, like which way does it point for you? Maybe it's a mix of the two. Um, what are you prepared to support right now? So when you're planning your publishing program, like how are you going to start and then think about like what you're going to scaffold into. So maybe you start with one project and then you build to three and then the next year you take five and um, How can you grow over later. How, do, how does your program become sustainable by thinking about it that way. Um, what conversations do you need to have in your organization to better answer these questions. Who do you need to talk to um, who has these answers? So if you could like sit down, do some reflection, think about who's at your organization. So maybe it's important to talk to like your supervisor and then maybe the dean of the library or the head of the instructional design unit. And then what partnerships will help? Hi everybody, working from home, scenes from working from home. So while Amanda is addressing her audio issues, I will um, give an example of one of the elements that she talked about, which is um, you know, how to get the program started. So I'm just gonna take a, a quick second, Amanda, and just talk about soft launches. And so a lot of times it's not starting your publishing program with a big call for proposals, but maybe starting your program because a faculty who you already have a relationship with said, I'm interested in this thing, I wanna try it. Are you doing anything like that? And then you find your collaborator and you can do a soft launch together. So it's not an official program. There's no um, trumpet sounding, but you can both learn together. And then even if you do need to sound the trumpets because it's coming um, from top down, I think it's really great, as Amanda said, to use that um, opportunity to be totally transparent. This is the first time we're doing this. We're doing this because we want to learn how to do it. So we're looking for people who are flexible and who understand that we're figuring this out. Um, there's a lot of, I think, matchmaking involved in figuring out which projects are, are a match for um, supporting where you are. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and then can any partnerships help? So thinking about like who at your institution you can collaborate with. Um, and that could be like Karen just said, a soft launch with like one instructor who's really interested in doing the thing um, or reaching out to your teaching and learning center and seeing if there's anybody there who's interested in doing OER or is already working with folks who are doing OER. Cause that's the other thing that you'll probably find is that none of this is reporting being reported up in any way that is consistent anywhere. And so there might be people who are already doing this kind of work who you could reach out to and um, talk to about their experience and get them to talk to other people about their experience and then help build sort of your publishing program that way as well. That's it, that's what I have. I left plenty of time for questions. Thank you, Amanda. And, and just as a note, you know, Amanda went over a ton of information just now. And so you might be feeling that information overload, but be assured that much of what she talked about was really an overview. As she said, we're gonna dive more deeply into many of the things she discussed with each presenter in Pub 101. So for example, uh, MOUs. And she also talked about uh, encouraging you to introduce faculty to one another if you end up with multiple faculty who are creating projects and Karen Bjork, who is presenting next week, has done just that, so she can talk a little bit about that if, if you have questions. I'm also going to drop another link in the chat about the Racial Justice Grant Program at Ohio State so you can read about it. I also put a link in the chat to a list of questions that faculty commonly ask as they start thinking about or start writing open textbooks, so you can take a look at that list of questions and think about how you might respond. It can also help you define your capacity. Even if you know the answer to the question, you might not be the person doing the thing that is in question. Now I saw two questions so far in the chat. Please feel free to uh, keep dropping them in or unmuting and uh, flagging us down. 
So Sarah asked if we could give an example of shared language. I'm not sure what shared language means. Yeah, I absolutely can. So one of the big things that you're going to probably want to start with is what definition of OER you're going to use. Um, so there are multiple definitions of what OER are. Um, and my advice um, that I often give is to start with the federal definition that is in the um, bill in, that provides that big federal grant for OER uh, projects because if you ever want to like work towards getting one of those grants, it's good to already have your definition aligned. Um, but there's like the UNESCO definition, there's a Spark definition, there's probably a David Wiley definition, there's lots of definitions. So like figuring out how you're gonna talk about OER. Um, another one that we are still working on at Ohio State is what do we call the resources? Um, so we work on a spectrum. So I work uh, supporting everything from free, out on the internet, public domain, uh, library resources, OER, and then um, inclusive access stuff. So what do we call the resources themselves? And um, so there's been some debate around like curricular resources, which is what I was told that they were going to be called when I came in. And now people are like, well, instructors won't get that. We should call it course content. But then instructors make course content. So like, so it's like figuring out how you're going to talk about the thing so that everybody's on the same page. Um, so you might want to talk about student savings in a specific way um, and anything that could come up with sort of like a definition problem where people could misconstrue it differently than what you mean is a good place to start thinking about shared language. And the nice thing about the MOU, even though it seems kind of a, a official and bureaucratic is that it can also be a tool to clarify. And so when we talk about MOUs, one of the recommendations that Carla will have is sitting down with someone and reading through the MOU together, because even the language in the MOU document, people can have two different assumptions about what it means. And to Amanda's point about defining OER, I think that's usually the kind of the first and very ongoing conversation is, well, when we say an open textbook, what do we mean by open? Yes. Um, there have been many, many of our colleagues who've gotten far down the road and then a faculty author mentions the royalties they look forward to making on the textbook. And then that's a really awkward conversation because uh, that's, you know, not what we've been collaborating on. Or Amanda mentioned, you know, finding a bunch of um, images or material in the textbook or OER that aren't openly licensed and, and realizing that, you know, there's just been a disconnect about what what we're talking about when we're talking about open or creative commons. So trying to get to that shared understanding. Um, let's see, Aylin, the work you describe sounds like editorial work. Do you get any credit for this aspect of your work when the books are published? So um, you can set up your program that way where you get editorial credit. Um, I didn't set up the program I was involved in that way. And I did have um, several faculty, though, who were like, we really want to represent the work you did. How would we do that? And so we talked through like whether that would be an editorial credit, whether they just wanted to put us in their acknowledgment section. Um, and I think what's important is when you think about um, transmitting the value of the work that you're doing behind the scenes is that you, you know, keep track of how many consultations you have, how many hours it takes you to do production work so that you can talk really in a really educated way about the work that you're doing. And, um, and numbers help a lot. So um, before I left Penn State, the semester before I left, like I did 93 consultations. Um, probably half of those were grant consultations before people came into um, the um, publishing cycle. So we put out a call for proposals. And a part of that is that they would have to meet with us and discuss their projects so that we could see if it was viable so that they weren't wasting their time and we weren't wasting our time. And if it wasn't, how could, and they were still interested, how could we make their project fit the parameters of the grant? So some of those consultations would have been grant work and then others were just consultations on OER. Um, and, but like, 
being able to say I did 93 consultations around OER shows that there's a demand for the service, shows that people are interested. Um, and so like keeping metrics that you can use to demonstrate that is very helpful. And it also helps to sort of keep track of like any really empowering stories. Um, so I had a faculty member who, um, it's hard to talk about this because I'm from the Midwest and it's like really embarrassing to have people who want to praise on you, but like who would like always talk me up in front of whoever we were with if we were in a group of people and it, I'd be really embarrassed, but it's still like being able to point to, oh, you can ask like faculty XYZ about the way that we work together um, is very helpful. Um, but yes, if you want editorial work and you are going to be doing that kind of editorial um, production work on a book, I would suggest setting that up ahead of time in sort of the structure of your program. And then um, thinking about whether you are doing like line editing and developmental editing. Um, and what's the other editing? Tech editing. Yeah, that's the other one. Um, what kind of like figuring out like what sort of like editorial role that you're going to play in that process um, so that you can explain it clearly when you're setting up those expectations. So I did a lot of developmental editing, which is making sure that everything in a text sort of hangs together in the same voice. It's all formatted correctly. All the chapters look the same sort of thing. And um, it's not proofreading, which a lot of people want is proofreading. It's not proofreading. Um, but that is a, an, another service you might offer. Um, and then if you were going to set it up that way, I would say, okay, so I'm going to do developmental editing for your book. Here's a definition of what that means. Very clear language. I will make sure the tone of your book is consistent throughout. I'll make sure the structure is consistent throughout. Um, and then also I will get this editor credit on your book. And um, and if somebody pushes back against that, you're like, this is what you agreed to ahead of time. Um, we made this together kind of deal. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, and I'll add to it, you know, more and more now as I look at submissions for the Open Textbook Library, I see information in the front matter saying, here is the team of people who supported mm -hmm. this book coming to be and really acknowledging and recognizing the contributions that people have made. And I think that is a common value that you will see um, in the open education community. There's, you know, we're always trying to acknowledge um, the contributions that many people make to something coming to be because it's not just a solo actor typically although that is another model um and you know to amanda's talk on editing and developmental editing and how it's different from proofreading uh if you are a part of the publishing cooperative that is something um, that we offer through a partnership with scribe so you might be thinking how in the world could we offer all of these different services we do um connect you with a professional back office publishing service provider who support loads of commercial publishers and uh, university presses and have been working with us for the last few years to get to understand open educational resource publishing and can provide those services for a fee if let's say you have some money but not a lot of staffing and time and you want to get these books out there um, there is of course uh, groups you can turn to Let's see, Millie asked MOU, do you have to get it cleared with university lawyer? And I'll say uh, quickly on our end, there is a great MOU draft that uh, Creative Commons and the OEN work together on um, and OEN members who put it in front of their um, university counsel or copyright attorneys and librarians. And so it's been sort of vetted at that level and then the next step that we say is yes please you know also at your institutional level because you might have different intellectual property uh requirements and, and roles yeah i would also say it's a it's a good idea to take it to general counsel's office and have them sign off on it um just to save yourself from any headache downstream um but i know lots of programs that don't I mean, I'm not going to lie to y'all. <laughs> there are lots of places that don't, but I would recommend going through the appropriate channels and getting it cleared with general counsel and realize that that might add like six months to your timeline, depending on how busy they are and how many changes they want. Um, 
and if you have a copyright services office they can probably help you with that um if not i would just go to like the general counsel's page and see how you're supposed to reach out to those folks Julia says, sorry if I missed it. Any advice about recruiting students as stakeholders on the collaborative team or working with student government, undergrads, graduate students? Yeah, so um, I think going to student government is a great way to recruit collaborators for the team. Um, I've had really positive experiences working with student government at all of the institutions I've been at. Um, uh, and um, at Penn State, there were students who sat on the university-wide um, OER working group, and um, they provided lots of feedback. Um, and we built really good relationships with the academic officers for the student government. And they would find us students for interviews. Um, they would talk to, they, they like, a lot of times your student government is going to be champing at the bit at some for something to do, particularly if they've run on sort of an affordability platform. So I just met with a student government at Ohio State and it was the same thing. So this is another institution, another place where it's a great idea to have like really clear communication and set really clear expectations. So when I first met with the student government at Penn State, they wanted to storm faculty senate and demand, you know, that more of their teachers used OER. And we're like, that might not be the best way to do that. <laughs> um, and, and they also have really interesting things that they're interested in. So they were interested in figuring out how they could do course markings. And we're trying to have conversations with folks um, in like the registrar to figure out how to do that. And um, so it, it helps them figure out sort of their end goals too if they have you as their friend in this example, um, in this figuring this out. Um, student government, um, there, another way, so if you're a librarian, library, like student workers in the library are also a great place to get feedback um, and can usually help you find other students who are interested in giving feedback. Um, and, trying to think. I, I love the idea of starting with student government. Um, I always start that conversation with student government of do they know about the student PIRGS, um, P-I-R-G-S, and that is an advocacy, um, and they, they have a textbook affordability advocacy kit that they can help your student government figure out. Um, and I tell them about that. And then I talk, I like, I usually just sit and listen to like what they have on their mind. What are, what are they interested in doing? And how can we partner to do the thing that they're interested in and start building that relationship? And then, um, then maybe in the next semester, come with the ask. Hey, we worked really well last semester. Um, you're still in here. So um, let's do X, Y, Z that we want to do with our publishing thing. Marilyn just said a great thing about um, student government giving a textbook hero award. And let me tell you, faculty like that stuff. Um, so that's a great, great way of doing that too. Thank you for linking to the PERG stuff. Sure. Um, Linda says, I saw a presentation by the OTN, now OEN, and if I recall, they were going to develop an integration with something free and easy for development. Was it WordPress or something similar as opposed to Pressbooks? Linda, I'm not totally sure, but you might be talking about uh, what we're calling right now really as a placeholder of the authoring tool, which could work with Pressbooks, Editoria, or other publishing platforms or software. But the tool that I'm thinking of, which might be different than the tool you're thinking of, uh, is more about coming up with textbook structure. So supporting authors and project managers in sort of that early process of how do I want this book to read? What do I want their reading experience to be for students? How do I want to open every chapter, close every chapter? Um, and actually we're meeting with our advisory group next month. We're currently uh, at the stage of identifying all of the different elements uh, commonly used in textbooks and openers and closers. 
And so that is progressing and coming along. If that does not sound like what you're thinking of, let me know. There are so many different authoring tools, so many different options. Um, and I think we can also address Wade's question. How do you respond to faculty concerns about how their work might be revised in a way they don't agree with and not end up licensing it CC by NCND? That ND, of course, meaning no derivatives and not really being open. So my snarky answer to that is that I didn't let them pick that license as a part of the grant. Um, it wasn't an option. They agreed at the very beginning that they would license their work either CCBY or uh, CCBYNC. Um, so thinking about like the goals of the program, did letting them pick any license benefit the program? And if your goal is to share out, the answer is not really. Um, and being really explicit about um, that this is different than we're trying to create an environment where this is different than um, a normal sort of predatory publishing environment where um, they might be more inclined to not share. Um, and the idea is we're starting from the very the very beginning of the project that we would love for this to their book to be adopted widely. And so that means that folks are going to have to change it for their local context and um, trying to phrase the conversation around it that way. Um, if they are ride and die for CCBY and C and D, I don't know that there's much that you can do to change their mind. And then I would think about um, maybe you can't support their project as part of the program, but you would still be happy to help them with like figuring out the OER parts. Because that's also a thing. Not every project is a perfect fit for what you're trying to do. And sometimes you just have to let people go if they're like really committed to one particular thing. And I think of it that way too, when I think about um, like interfacing with departments who are super not interested, like you can only try so many times and before you're beating your head against the wall, doing the same thing over and over, which is the definition of insanity. And so um, let's not do that. Instead, let's pick our battles and think about, um, okay, so I've reached out to, a example I can give is I reached out to the English department several times. They very clearly said that they weren't interested in working with us. They published their book and receive payments from students for it they weren't going to transition, just wasn't gonna happen. So I stopped spending energy trying to get them to convert and worked with departments who were willing. And eventually it'll come around where everybody else is doing it and they'll be the only ones who aren't and they'll have to explain why they're still charging their students for the textbook and getting that money back. So um, that's another good thing to think about is be careful where you spend your time. Don't spend it fruitlessly. Um, I hope that helps. Thanks, Amanda. We also had a question from Taylor about uh, suggestions for tools similar to Pressbooks or a template to build and create a textbook that are free. Um, there is, I think, actually a, an open textbook builder through OER Commons, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, that you could experiment with. Uh, the nice thing about Pressbooks, you can actually uh, use a free instance. There might be a watermark, but um, there's it is an open source, source tool. Um, and the nice thing about that is you could find or the author could find a textbook that they like the structure and they could clone it, essentially copy it, and then just kind of use that as a template. And then I put um, a link to our Canvas curriculum in the chat as well that takes you to other common tools, certainly not an exhaustive list, um, some of them openly licensed and open source and some of them not as much but uh, readily available to most faculty authors, for example, like Word or Google Docs. Um, there's really so many different ways to publish. So we are at our hour. I will send a follow-up note to everyone tomorrow. Before you go, please join me in thanking Amanda for sharing her valuable expertise, experience. And um, it's great to be here again with all of you. And I wish you a good week until we meet again. Thank you all for coming.
Thank you. Thank you. See you all next week. Bye. Take care.